sort of bigger than Jackson, but smaller than the entire 14 state region. So this will be live streamed and archived. So even if we have a small group, it will still go down in posterity. <laughs> People will be able to, to see it. Um, I hope we get one. I have a power are really my earlier one, but I, I don't think I'm going to use it. But I, okay. could, I could make it available. Lots of great that would be great. Because it probably, I have it here, but um, okay. maybe after work you'll be here. Yeah, I'll be here. Okay, we'll just put it in. Okay. And I don't think Bobby can do it. That would be great, yeah. Um, What's your name? Margaret. Oh, hi. I'm Dennis. Dennis. Dennis, great. Yeah, or if you just wanted to email it to Chris. Oh, I can do that. Then we can put it up on the website as a resource. In fact, I, well, I haven't emailed him this one, so I'll set okay. I, get, I emailed him another one so okay. we can see what it was like. Great. But I have this one. Great. Okay, is that easier? That's probably easier to Okay. Do. Yeah. People are being really slow <laughs> to move. Yeah. No. Kevin's down there, like, hurting them. But well, you know, food is always hard to uh, stop people from talking. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. We should coordinate more. So why don't we plan to start by one? Because that's going to cut us down. We have till 2.45. Oh, no, 2.40. Because the afternoon session starts at 2.45. Oh, the afternoon starts at 2.45. Oh, yeah. It's hard to squeeze a full all of this into. We only have it's a free space, but we only have it from eight to four thirty. Though. So I guess anytime you want to start. Uh, do we want to start? Uh, it's, 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 I'm just trying to think if people are still like mingling downstairs or go fight over that. Up to you. It's up to you. Yeah. Okay. We do have. Are you guys okay with that? I hate to penalize the ones who. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll, go, we'll start one. Well, okay. And that gives us still an hour and 40 minutes, which I think. We'll make right. everybody who comes in late do a couple push ups to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> no good deed goes on the other <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so 2.5, we have so the, point, point. the closing yeah. plenary. And that's the real meat Christmas. where, okay, now Christmas what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> Talking Take is over great. The world. Exactly, that's my Christmas. plan. I'm going to be that weekend. I'm going to be New York. session was that larger? I think it was larger, but that was the one of like existing co-ops and what are... Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. So. Oh, here's good. Oh. Yeah. I thought it was really long. Yeah. Um, so, what order are we going in? Yeah. You, you, you went to go last? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You want to go first or second? I, maybe your PowerPoint's already. Okay. Alright. Okay. Want to go ahead? 
My name is Justin Beers. I'm the sustainability manager at the medical center across the street. And I'm interested in seeing how we as an anchor institution can partner with or help support co-ops um, to meet our needs and also to kind of the community. My name is Rosemont Sims and I work at a cooperative place in Baltimore. Friends. And I'm uh, interested in seeing the different models and how we can do this. John do this one up. Yeah. Um, I'm Heather Hacks. Um, I am a collective member at a sister project of Red Emma's called 2640. Oh, yeah. In there. Yeah. You just got one over here. Uh, well, okay. You want to go first? Okay. Sure. Um, I'm Amanda Rothschild. I am a worker owner at a um, coffee shop, also in Baltimore. It's called Charmington. Is it? I'm uh, Margaret Flowers. I'm co-director of It's Our Economy. Okay, thanks everybody. So I'm going to try to go through uh, this model that we've worked on in the Democracy Club, so you'll actually see a model of co-op development. I'll, I'll, I'll say uh, at the outset that I always find uh, 
discussion of models is, is sometimes problematic because it can be um, it can be restrictive in ways that, that don't actually fit your situation. So uh, I think it's better to think about this in terms of principles uh, than, than a real model. Nonetheless, it's been referred to in the literature and so forth as the Cleveland model, so I'm using that here. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is just a little bit about the Democracy Cloud. We've been around since 1999. I've been there since 2004. And three different things we do uh, research. We have a report, actually, that's going to come out, uh, authored by Hilary Abel, who's the former executive director of Wages, Women's Action to Gain Economic Security. It's a network of five uh, house cleaning co-ops in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, that'll be coming out at the beginning of June, looking at different forms of incubating co-ops. So really, this session's topic, in a way. Uh, but we write a lot of different research reports on green economy, um, role of anchor institutions, um, hospitals, universities, and so forth, uh, as well as community wealth building, this notion of building wealth in low-income communities. Uh, we do field building. We have a website, community-wealth.org, uh, which is an information clearinghouse on a lot of strategies. I encourage you to visit it. It's not just our stuff. It really tries to represent the field as a, as a whole. And, and then we do advisory work, this project-based work, which is what I'm going to be talking about here. Uh, so Cleveland's where our work is most developed, but we've also worked in Atlanta, where they're developing a greenhouse co-op that they hope to open next year. And uh, in Prince George's County, not far away, uh, next to Washington, D.C., uh, there's a stormwater management and monitoring co-op that's being <coughs> developed and should launch before the end of this year. Um, so that's, that's our work. Next slide. Here. Uh, so this is just a brief definition of community wealth building. The idea is to create economic prosperity uh, by democratizing wealth and ownership, in particular by broadening the ownership of, of capital. And the numbers are kind of astonishing. Uh, you're probably familiar with them, but I will throw them out just in case, I guess. Um, in terms of income, you know, when, when I was growing up, Say in the 1970s, you know, the top 1% of Americans owned, earned about 8% of all income in the United States. And today that's closer to 20%. So it's a dramatic shift that we've had in the last three or four decades. Um, not that it was terribly equitable back in the so-called good old days then, uh, but it was much more equitable than it is today. Uh, and in terms of wealth, the numbers are even more dramatic. If you, folks here, are you familiar with the Forbes 400 list? So the 400 families or people who are on that list combined have uh, over $2 trillion in assets. So that's $5 billion per person. Um, the bottom 60% of the US population has about $1.2 trillion. So in other words, 400 people have about 50% more assets than the bottom 185 million combined. Uh, that's the dramatic uh, level of, yeah. and, and Gar Alpovitz, who was going to be speaking here uh, last night, I guess got uh, stymied by the trains, and uh, but he, he, he would call this a medieval figure, right? You know, you think about lords and serfs, right? Uh -huh. um, and he was on a speaking tour for his book that came out last year, and, and there was a medieval historian in the audience. And the historian said, you know, it really was never that bad. So the, the middle of, so the distribution was much worse today than it was in the Middle Ages. Um, so, that's, so that's part of the reason why we're motivated to do this work. If you, try, if you can have business capital collectively owned, you can start to shift that uh, paradigm from what we have today. Um, there's a lot of other pieces to it. You know, anchoring jobs locally really important in global economy. Uh, and obviously, if you have businesses that are, that are anchored in place, they generate tax revenues, which can support uh, public services, which, as we all know, uh, many cities are dealing with pension crises and other crises based on lack of revenue. And so this is really important. Uh, and I'll talk about like anchor institutions in particular, because you'll see how that's important for what we're doing in Cleveland. Next slide. Uh, so this is a long slide. Uh, I will make slides available. I'm not going to go through this list, other than to mention that you can find out about a lot of these things on our website, and uh, that in developing your own strategies, you should think about a lot of different tools. In Cleveland in particular, we're using anchor institutions and worker cooperatives. 
We also have a community, CDFI is Community Development Financial Institution, so we're creating our own Community Development Loan Fund as part of an integrated system. Um, based on, as uh, Dennis will surely mention when he talks, uh, this model in Spain called uh, Mondragon, uh, which has its own credit union that has financed its uh, cooperative development. Uh, next, next slide. And so anchor institutions. So, uh, so the word anchor institution came to being sort of in the late 1990s. Uh, there was a professor at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, Ira Harkavy, who wrote about it. Also, uh, Michael Porter at Harvard Business School. And you know, the idea is that these are you know have sticky capital that they're large employers and and, and stay in place. Uh, and typically, they're nonprofit or public in ownership, which means that um, their purpose, the, the fiduciary duty, if you will, of the board of trustees of a hospital or a university, is to serve the public good. You know, it's not to maximize shareholder value because there are no shareholders. Um, the mindset of the board of trustees of universities and hospitals, who are also often also corporate executives themselves, is often not different than a for-profit corporation, but their legal duty is quite different. And, and so part of our strategy is to tap into that and you know, say it's a more mission line way of acting as an institution. Um, and you know, it's worth noting, just briefly, we're in Baltimore. I'm sure folks are familiar with EBDI and some other projects. Uh, Lots of bad things have been done by universities and hospitals. So the fact that they have a fully purpose. Um, Charles Ruthizer wrote a forward of a book that I co-authored, you know, said, you know, he's doing ethnographic interviews uh, in the community. He said, you know, how is it to live near an anchor institution? And the uh, community member said, you know, looked at him sort of quizzically, what's an anchor institution? And she was like, oh, I get it. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, anchor's what drops on your head. <laughs> so, so we were aware of the, the reality. You know, the, the reality that it's also true, however, that a lot of universities, um, including, believe it or not, to some degree at least, Hopkins and some others are, are starting to look at their role differently and, and think about how they can be aligned with the community. So, uh, it is something that, as an organizer, you can hopefully use. Uh, next slide. Uh, and this is what we've labeled sort of this idea of alignment with community welfare or well-being uh, you know, to consciously and strategically apply the long-term place-based economic power uh, in combination with human intellectual resources. So we're not ignoring the importance of partnerships, of, of you know, that human element, uh, the education that universities provide, the health services that hospitals provide. Uh, but what we're saying is it should be integrated. And this isn't just a problem for hospitals and universities, you know. Uh, foundations have the same problem where they, they give out 5% of their money for grants, the other 95% uh, is often just invested in the stock market or hedge funds, you know, and sometimes in, in ways that are completely contradictory. So you could have a foundation supporting healthy kids, for example, and then making money on uh, tobacco stocks that are then you know, financing those grants. Um, so obviously the two sides of the foundation that point are, are, are acting at cross purposes. Obviously there's a movement within foundations to have mission really aligned investing and this is sort of a similar movement within hospitals and universities. Uh, next slide. Uh, so these are the co-ops and I just thought I'd start with the, what we actually have. Um, so it's about 90 workers at three businesses after a process of um, seven years. So it, it's not a quick and easy type of thing. Um, but on the left you can see pictures of Evergreen Cooperative Laundry. It's a green laundry. It, uh, laundry, if you know anything about laundry, not particularly environmentally friendly industry. Um, lots of chemicals, lots of you know, heating and so forth, but this uses about one fourth as much water per pound of laundry as a conventional commercial laundry. Uh, therefore heats one fourth as much water. Uh, it's an elite silver facility. It, it, Relative to the norm, it's it's quite green, uh, and it employs about 40 people. This is a solar, and in the, in the center you can see Evergreen Energy Solutions. They do solar. They also do uh, LED lighting installations. Um, employs about 40 <coughs> people, and and then the greenhouse about 25 people. Uh, 
um, that's on the right, Queen City Growers. Um, you know, the, the solar company has done about two megawatts of solar installation so far, um, including on the rooftops of the hospitals and universities and one of the local city halls. Um, and and just did a it's in the process of doing a ground mounted five acre uh, installation that will be more than a megawatt of power. Uh, the greenhouse is still up, getting up to capacity, at full capacity. It's the size of uh, basically of a Walmart store. You know, it's about 180,000 square feet um, under glass, uh, growing area about 150,000 square feet, and uh, it can grow about three million head of lettuce and about 300,000 pounds of herbs at full capacity. So uh, that per. started up more recently. Per. Per year. per year, per year, yeah. So it's about three percent of the Northeast Ohio lettuce market. Um, the laundry would be about four percent at full capacity. Um, laundry and the solar at this point are past break even are actually profitable. The the greenhouse is still in startup. Um, next slide. And you know why did we do this? Why did the institutions do this? So this is a map from two thousand six. In other words, it's before the Great Recession. Um, and in the center, you can see the Cleveland Clinic on the left, uh, Case Western Reserve University on the right, is up above that is University Hospitals, uh, up above that, uh, somewhere there is VA Hospital. You can see there's, there's not a lot of dots in that inner circle, which is known as the University Circle. It's kind of a second downtown in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, a highly disinvested city, um, went from 900,000 people in 1950 to about uh, 390,000 as of the last census, so a drop of about 500,000 people over, you know, half century. Um, surrounding, you see all these dots. These are water being shut offs, uh, tax liens, uh, basically indications of foreclosure. And as I said, before the Great Recession. Um, so you have median household income in the area surrounding these institutions of 18,500 per household. Um, half are above that, half below. That's Median is, um, and there's 55,000 people being employed by those institutions, but they're not coming from here. They're coming from over there on the right, through the suburbs, right? Um, obvious uh, racial dynamics too. You know, these suburbs are white. These neighborhoods are African American, uh, about 90 percent. And and so the idea with the Cleveland Foundation, which is a community foundation there, oldest community foundation in the country, celebrating its 100th anniversary. Um, was to break down this divide and, and think about how can you tap into the procurement. Three billion dollars is spending each year, these three institu these institutions within the circle, um, and use that to create living wage jobs. Uh, and so we were asked to, as consultants, to sort of come up with a strategy and, and the co-ops were what we came up with. Uh, next slide. Um, so, so how do you do this? Um, you know, uh, you start, you don't necessarily go to the anchor institution the first day and say, how about changing your procurement and uh, moving everything into uh, co-op businesses? That's not, not how it works. Um, so, so it's talking with each other actually, which is something the Cleveland Foundation did a couple years before we came to Cleveland, actually was important. Um, and, and they hadn't met. The, 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 they wouldn't talk to each other. They were, they were competitors, so it was fierce competitors, especially to hospitals. Um, so doing that was important. Uh, start with uh, easy steps that are in the institution's self-interest. So what, what the foundation did, they worked on two things, transportation, getting state dollars into the neighborhood, basically, to redo transit stops, um, and uh, employer-assisted housing, so getting uh, subsidized housing for their own employees. So that was, those were easier asks than changing your procurement. Later on, they talked about procurement. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this is the work that we've done, not just in Cleveland, but in those other cities that were listed. Um, it, I didn't even know it was market research when I started it. You know, but we were doing lots of interviews and coming up with ideas for businesses. And that happens to be called market research. <laughs> um, and so, you know. You can only do so much through makes codes. I don't know if you know what makes codes are, but every North American industrial classification system. So you can every every job has a six-digit code in the United States, um, and you can get data from the Department of Commerce. It's good as a first cut. It won't get you anywhere in terms of active business development. Um, so we we met met with 
folks in the university, uh, you know, within the decision makers in different departments and on the community development. And about 30 of those folks were actual supply chain folks. And that, that was critical to try to find areas of, of interest. Next slide. Um, so, you know, one thing, just a couple sort of lessons that came out of the interview. One is, you know, the first thought was that this was just a charity ask. They're used to getting nonprofits asking them for benefits. So the idea that they were actually being asked to do a business proposition required convincing. Um, and uh, they, this act of listening is important. We ended up developing green businesses in part because of environmental principles, but also um, really because that was what they wanted. They had signed climate agreements and so forth. So those pro pronouncements that they make sometimes are important. And the reality is community development is somewhat, amp can be, it can have ambiguous effects. You improve the neighborhood, but you force people out, or what have you, right? You know, so gentrification being an obvious example. Institutions are leery about being involved in that. So if they could say they were reducing their carbon footprint, which is pretty unassailable, you, use it, you, know, you can measure that to the you know, metric ton or whatever, um, that was an easier ask. And then they were happy to do the community owned businesses, provided they had these you know, firm deliverables that they could count on. And next slide. And these are just some of the ideas uh, that actually came through in the different interviews we've done. So not to say this would work at your anchor institution, but it might. Um, so you know, some of these we've developed into actual businesses. You can see LED lighting is one of them. Uh, the, uh, let's see, stormwater we're going to be doing in Prince George's County, but it wasn't in Cleveland. Um, you know, some of these have not proven uh, to, to work out, at least not yet. Um, but that's that's just how we did it, and we look for areas of overlap. Uh, right, next slide. Before you move yeah. on, are yeah. they ranked in any kind of order? Is there any kind of order there? It's not. It's a random order on this slide. Um, certainly, shuttle service is not the most important one. Um, it depends on the market. Like in in D in DC, uh, laundry. Everyone thought laundry was a good idea for somebody else, so we're not doing laundry. Um, you know, it's got to be a good idea for your business. Um, you know, in Cleveland we did laundry. Uh, greenhouses tend to have been popular everywhere. Stormwater has been hugely important in D.C. And, and they're looking at it in Cleveland now, but it uh, wasn't an issue as much in Atlanta. So it really depends on, you know, in D.C. there's uh, corridors to clean up the Anacostia as a Potomac. So that's driving a lot of that. And it may be true of Baltimore as well. Um, the whole Chesapeake Basin is a problem area in terms of stormwater. Um, next slide. Um, so, uh, you know, this requires partners. I don't want to leave you with the impression that we do this all ourselves because we don't. Um, and so, what we've tried to do is find people. Ohio Employee Ownership Center in Ohio did a lot of the employee ownership part, uh, financing. We work with a group called National Development Council. Um, there's a group in workforce development, which is training before you get hired, uh, called Towards Employment in Cleveland. Uh, and we work a lot with the city as well as with new markets folks, um, consultants to do the financing. Um, next slide. And this is just a structure, so I wanted to give a, a picture of how it looks. Uh, so there's a nonprofit corporation. Uh, Evergreen Business Services is essentially hires the managers. They provide support services uh, to different co-ops, uh, HR, accounting, payroll, so forth. Um, there's a land company that's owned by the, the, by the nonprofit. Uh, there's the loan fund I mentioned. Um, the co-ops themselves, 80% of the ownership is in the employee owners, 20% is in the nonprofit. The way it's done is as a multi-stakeholder cooperative uh, with class A and class, actually class C shares, because we have class B that's not used for potential outside money. Um, but the, basically, to do something like the sale of a company, you would need a majority of class A voters and a majority of class C voters. What that means is that the nonprofit has a veto over selling or dissolution of the company. Um, you could imagine a company being so successful the competitor wants to buy them out and it offers them a good price. We didn't want that to happen. Um, next slide. Uh, 
Uh, so these are different elements. I'm going to try to go through this quickly because I'm taking a little bit too much time. But these are the elements that, uh, you know, when we go to a different city, we try to look for who's going to champion the project, uh, who's going to do the, who's actually going to do the business development. Uh, is there some kind of community development loan fund or financial institution that can be a partner? Uh, who's going to do the workforce uh, training work? Is there city or county government backing, that's important, not because they're gonna give you money, but there's a lot of federal resources like community development block grant money that uh, they have the power to allocate. Um, and we've used uh, something called Section 108 of the community development block grant law, uh, which allows for borrowing for at low interest rates to start up businesses. Uh, and of course, support from the anchor institutions and, and support from the community as well. So those are some of the things that we're looking for in, in different cities when we go. And sometimes it looks viable and sometimes less so. Um, next slide. So this, as I said, these I'm gonna have to go through really quickly just to give time to everyone else. These are some of the things we look for from a project champion. Particularly the convening is most important. The money is important too, but having that ability to bring people together. Um, next slide. Uh, business development. So we do the market studies. We don't do the actual business planning, which you would look at the amount of capital you need, who are your competitors, those kind of industry-specific things, uh, as well as finding managers, which is one of the hardest parts of this. Um, next slide. Question. Yeah. Um, what do you think? What do you mean by managers? Well, you have to hire somebody. Well, you don't have to. I mean, you could have a man. You know, we're trying to do businesses that are, you know, twenty to forty people. Right. And and so the idea is you you try to get somebody who's industry has industry specific knowledge to get the business actually functioning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that is a choice. You know, um, uh, community loan fund incubator. I talked about that. I think, but new markets tax credits are important. Just to mention. Uh, they're the uh, lending, they, they, what they do is they convert in, they give you low interest loans. They also, a portion of the, of the new markets tax credit actually converts into equity after seven years. So for example, the laundry had a $5 million new markets tax credit allocation, 3.8 million will get paid back to the investors. They get a $2 million tax break, so they come out ahead. Give you 3.8 plus two, it's more than five. Um, but the 1.2 that's left over at the end after seven years is cash, which is hugely important for, for building your projects. Um, unfortunately, there are about 400,000 fees you have to pay on that, but it's a different story. Uh, next, next slide. Still, 1.2 million is better than 400,000, so you can come out ahead too, believe it or not. Um, so, you know, doing customized education and training and continuous education and training really important and something that we underestimated how important. So we can talk more about that Q and A. Next slide. Uh, local government. Um, so I think I talked about CDBG in Section 108. Um, they can also help with land assembly, which can be very important. Um, it's hard to find 10 acres in the same place, which is what we need to do, even in Cleveland, where it's lots of vacant land. That has to be in the right. It has to be contiguous, and it has to be zoned correctly to be able to do anything with it. Um, next slide. Anchor institutions, so you know, you need anchors to be willing to talk to you and actually share confidential information that makes this kind of process work. Um, and you know, it helps the more you can link it to their main mission, public health. You know, we know that uh, for hospitals that the that the, the biggest determinant of, of healthcare outcomes is poverty. So if you can reduce poverty, that actually improves health, which helps the hospitals bottom line. Uh, for, for universities, you know, engage, there's a lot of information on engaged scholarship and why that, at having um, researchers and students working in the community actually is useful and for the university as well as potentially helpful for the community. So, you, but you have to make those cases. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, we work with churches and CDCs and other groups. It'll depend on your, you, you'll know your community as to who those trusted partners are. Um, we've also tried to work uh, a lot with uh, the Cleveland Foundation in particular has developed a model based on something that was developed with uh, Bill Trainer in Lawrence, Massachusetts originally called a network separate model of community organizing. Really starting with block parties and then 
multi-block parties, you know, one, once a month network meetings of, of multiple blocks uh, to build sort of relationships in many communities where those social bonds have been broken down because of things like urban renewal and all the violence that's been done to uh, poor and minority communities in the United States. I mean, we can't, we can't forget that this, there's a history of structural racism that we're, we're fighting against in doing this work. Um, next slide. Um, this can be a lot of questions, but these are some of the challenges that we meet in, in our work. Um, you know, uh, so it's not an automatic process to get folks to be able to self-manage and self-govern. Uh, probably the hardest thing has actually though been to, um, you know, the meeting the business standards, and that's been more of an issue of finding the right management more than the right workers. The workers have actually been great. It's been challenging to find people who know how to manage in an empowered workplace environment and still know the industry. That combination has been challenging. Uh, next slide. Quick question on yeah. that challenge. Yeah. Um, is it easier to find, <clears throat> is it easier to train the manager in the industry or in the, the model, the cooperative model? So uh, you have to choose one or the other. Where yeah, we tend to choose on the, the industry and figure that <laughs> we certainly had problems in both directions, okay. but um, it, it's, I mean, since it's really hard if you're doing something that's multi-industry, if you're doing something that's single industry, that might be easier to do it differently. But if you're doing uh, multi-industry, you're not going to know the ins and outs of the laundry industry or the stormwater management industry or what have you. And so you kind of have to hope that the person you hire has that expertise and then is, you know, Edu open <laughs> to being educated and, okay, this is a different type of business model and, you know, where we're trying to empower, you know, the worker owners and so forth. Um, and uh, so that's, there's no automatic. We, we got somebody from laundry once who knew the industry in and out and just wasn't right for this environment and no longer there as a result. So we've had to make those kind of changes. Uh, but but I would, if you had to choose, I would choose on the industry. Um, some basic lessons, uh, I think, fit for any model maybe. Um, you know, to start with developing assets, not look at what, what, what are already exists in the neighborhood and build off of that rather than just, oh, well, there's the problems of you know, poverty, unemployment, and so forth. That, that only gets you so far, so it's really important to identify what are your building blocks. Um, inclusive approach to, to, to decision making. Uh, develop the vision. You know, it's really easy to say, oh, this is impossible because it costs a lot of money, which it, it does cost a fair amount of money. Um, but um, if you have the vision, you can often acquire the money, and a lot of this like the laundry is a five and a half million dollar business, but the philanthropic contribution to it was seven hundred fifty thousand. So it, you can leverage a lot of resources if you have a viable business plan. Um, and you know, my last point, you know, this is just one model among many. And you know, I think you know, as we do, as this work becomes more common, keep in mind how rare worker co-ops still are in the United States. Less than five thousand people in worker co-ops across the United States. Um, but as this becomes more common, I think we're going to start seeing a lot of elements of different models brought together. Um, next slide. And I think that's it. So uh, move on to uh, Dennis. And I think, I, I don't know, how do we want to do, do we want to do questions at the end? Does that make sense? Or do you want to do? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dennis Olson. I, uh, I'm a senior research associate at the Food Processing, Packing, and Manufacturing Division of the United Food and Agriculture Workers Union. Um, we have, just to give you a little background the, on the union, the union has 1.3 million members um, in the United States and Canada. Um, about 250,000 of those workers are in food processing and meat packing, mostly meat packing. Um, the rest of the million or so are in retail, mostly retail groceries. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit, it is from more of that 50,000 foot level of the international, I work for the International Union out of Washington, D.C., but I've been working on the our Harvest Union Co-op out of Cincinnati with our local uh, our point person there is an organizer named Alan Vera, who spearheaded that, that initiative there in the context of the Cincinnati Union Co-op Initiative, which is a broader 
umbrella committee uh, initiative overarching that one project. In fact, the Cincinnati Union Co-op Initiative actually now has six other businesses that are being um, in various stages of development under that, that auspices of that umbrella. But um, before I go into specifics of the, of the Cincinnati, the R Harvest model, of the co-op model, I just want to give this context from why an international union um, is looking at this and, and why it might make sense from our perspective. And to do that, I'm just going to kind of tell a story of how what set me up to come in and meet Ellen and get involved in the or our harvest uh, gets set up before I met Ellen back in 2010. Um, <clears throat> we were heavily engaged uh, as a union in the, I don't know, people here remember this, but in 2010, the Obama administration launched a um, antitrust initiative with the US USDA and the Department of Justice to investigate whether there needed to be more antitrust enforcement in agricultural markets, and they held five regional hearings across the country on various aspects of that question, different uh, sectors, dairy, poultry, livestock, crops, etc retail uh, and all that sort of thing. And so we engaged heavily in that process. Uh, we turned out our members to all five of those regional hearings. Uh, our leaders spoke on some of those panels. Um, and we generally supported, sort of we lined up with the progressive farm movement, the, the family farm advocates who were demanding more antitrust enforcement and more uh, fair price for farmers. Um, and we generally supported the whole initiative and supported fair prices for farmers, but we also were demanding that they, uh, they expand the investigation, that they take a step back and um, look at the entire food supply chain. Um, and that means including the retail grocery sector, which means including Walmart, um, which is uh, basically our nemesis on a lot of fronts. Um, with a million, uh, you know, of our members in the retail grocery sector, um, every time one of our employers, a Kroger or a Safeway, um, takes market share or closes a sto store of Kroger or Safeway, those are our members who lose their jobs and benefits, and it also then drags down the standards across the entire retail grocery sector um, for labor. And so that's, you know, a big concern of ours. Uh, we're also concerned um, because of the rise of uh, the, the unprecedented rise in Walmart's firepower and the model that it has created that everyone else is basically trying to emulate. Um, and so in 1987, Walmart wasn't even selling groceries. Um, and today they're about 25% of the U.S. market. And they're bigger than their next three competitors combined. So that's how dramatic of an increase that was. And from an antitrust perspective, none of that was ever reviewed because the only entry point to review it is in the context of a merger. Um, that's the only time that the Justice Department um, or the FTC would look at that is if there was a merger. And of course, with Walmart in the United States, there never was a merger. That, just, that was just organic growth of the company. So it never had any uh, antitrust review. So in our bank, we wrote, released a report called Ending, our, uh, Ending Walmart's Rural Stranglehold and in the context of these uh, hearings. And the basic um, arguments in there was this argument that we needed to expand the investigation. And mainly what we were talking about is that we needed to bring the, the, the Federal Trade Commission into the investigation along with USDA and the Justice Department. Um, because the federal FTC actually has the primary jurisdiction over the retail grocery sector. So the USDA and, and the Justice Department have some overlapping um, authority there, but generally, but primarily if, if you're going to do antitrust enforcement against a Walmart or anybody in retail grocery, you have to go through the, the FTC is the one that has to do it. Um, they have the expertise, and so we wanted them at the table because we wanted everybody to take a step back and look at the entire food supply chain. Um, because even though we were, so we were in favor of farmers getting a fair price, but because of this unprecedented buyer power, our concern was say that they actually won and they got a fair price and a bigger share of the um, retail food dollar. Um, that would be all well and good unless you don't address the Walmart buyer power problem um, in which case you would still have the Tyson and the 
JBSs and all these major employers that we have, in addition to the retail sectors, um, you know, those companies like Tyson is the biggest meat packer in the country, um, and they sell 20% of their production, uh, of their meat production to Walmart, which is about $13 billion a year. So Tyson cannot walk away from Walmart. So if, 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 if Walmart says they want organically grown or antibiotic-free chicken or whatever it is, that all costs money. And if Walmart says we want that to Tyson and it's going to cost money, and Tyson says, well, it's going to cost money, we can't do it. Walmart's going to say, well, too bad. You know, if you don't want it, we'll go find somebody else to buy the 20 year, 20 20 percent of your production from. So Tyson really can't walk away from that. So what Tyson does is that it's it's a big producer, and so it squeezes everybody else. It'll it'll go ahead and say we can't give up Walmart, so we'll squeeze everybody else both down the supply chain. So if you get if farmers were actually getting a fair price, a fair price with better antitrust enforcement at that transaction level, and Tyson's still getting squeezed by Walmart, well, when we come to the negotiating table with Tyson, Tyson's going to say, well, sorry, you know the farmers are getting more, we're still getting squeezed by Walmart, so you're going to have to get less. That was our major concern of this, and that's why we felt that the whole antitrust question had to be looked at from the perspective of the whole um, supply chain. Um, so that that sort of was the context, and the long and the short of that was the whole effort. Basically, there's a tremendous <coughs> industry backlash, um, and the Obama mission, uh, the Obama administration just totally went in full retreat, and the whole thing collapsed eventually. So it was somewhat of a disaster because it was almost worse than doing nothing because everybody got their hopes up and then they were just shattered. You know, so it was pretty depressing. Um, the last hearing, though, we did get them to send the, the FTC person was on the last panel, which was the retail to farm spread. And the problem is, is that what the FTC guy said is that, um, you know, that Walmart's buyer power is a good thing because it provides lower prices to consumers, right? And that is the only test now in U.S. antitrust policy that um, agencies or the courts will look at is whether or not um, whatever practice, whatever predator, predatory practice is being practiced is whether it results in lower prices into good consumers or not. And if it results in lower prices to consumers, then any, anything goes, basically. There's a whole other side of that I'm not going to get into. We might be able to get into it in the credits, but it, basically the Supreme Court has made rulings that that's the law of the land until we change that at this point. And so that that's where, we're, um, where we ended up, and that's why this FTC guy said, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. And um, so we then, that it was after those hearings that I was invited to come and speak to our local 75 in Cincinnati because they'd heard about our engagement in this process and wanted to hear more about it. And that's where I, so I gave, went and gave that presentation and I met Ellen Vera, this was almost four years ago now. And she was saying, oh, this is, she heard the presentation, that's interesting, and there's this Our Harvest program where our harvest uh, it wasn't even our harvest then, it was the Cincinnati Union Co-op Initiative and the Farm and Food Hub. And um, they were just getting started and it was based on this, um, the 2009 agreement between the Mondragon Cooperative out of the Basque Country of Spain, Michael Tech is here from them today, and uh, the United Steel Workers, and um, Leo Giard, and Michael tells the story better than I did, but the way Michael tells it is that they were at the 2009 Council of Economic Advisors meeting of the Obama administration, one of the, fir the first one. And, um, and it was Timothy Geithner, Larry Sumners, um, you know, Ben Bernanke, all the usual suspects who had just plunged us into the abyss of the 2008 the collapse. And Michael and, um, and uh, Leo walked out shaking their heads saying, we've got to come up with a different model. Um, we can't just go and do the bait and Wall Street bait and switch model again because people are tired of that. And and I think what was happening is, you, from what, what my limited experience with Cincinnati is, is that there was sort of an old guard of labor folks there that had actually been to Mondragon a decade or so earlier and were very inspired by it and had been thinking about how would they bring the Mondragon model over to the U.S. and incorporate it into the labor union the labor movement here, 
Um, and then you also have this younger generation of Ellen's 20-something generation that are also very fired up about trying to do something. And so for my, what my take on it is, is that when that 2009 agreement um, happened, that was sort of catalyzed them into action and they created what was called the Cincinnati Union Co-op Initiative. And they brought unions to the table and other community groups and community leaders to the table and had a discussion about the model wanted to go with the model, and then they had a discussion about what businesses made the most sense, given who was at the table, especially, uh, you know, from the, especially the unions and the sectors they were representing. And so one of the first six businesses that they chose and that UFCW wanted was a farm and food hub. And so we are, the, the Cincinnati Our, Our, Our Harvest Co-op, Union Co-op, is a farm and food hub. Um, so we're food workers, and that made sense. And um, Ellen has been working on that now for over three years. We're going into our third year of harvest. We're at 15 employees, and about eight of those are full-time year-round, and about seven of them are uh, part uh, full-time seasonal. We're farming 10 acres and at least another 100 acres. Um, and I think part of it is that Ohio is unique in that it has these amazing resources there in, in Ohio State University and others. And I think part of it actually goes back to like the steel workers in the 80s where they were experimenting with trying to buy back steel plants that were being shut down after NAFTA, etc. cetera. And uh, so one of the groups that's helped us out over this, over this project has been the Ohio Employee Ownership Center that I think came out of that effort in the in the 80s and 90s, and then uh, Ohio Cooperative Development Center, the A Extension Service is very progressive, very helpful on these on the food farm and food outside, um, and they're all sort of housed under uh, the umbrella of the Ohio State South, South Center. So that was an amazing set of resources, and these guys, I mean, so Ellen was really the only paid staff person for the first three years or so, and even then, it was the, our local was letting her spend 20% of her staffing time for the local on this. But she was like working two jobs and her, her co-chair, um, Kristen Barker, was working two jobs. And so I think it's an important point to make that that was you know, very, mostly volunteer effort that got them as far as they got under that. Um, and uh, there was a major breakthrough last year when Mondragon hired Kristen as full-time and she's now working full-time, not just on Cincinnati, but, but also trying to um, spread the, the model around the country. Um, so, but, and I say all that to say that I think the other reason that it was, it, one reason of the success was having that grounded steering committee in the community. Another part of this success um, was that expertise that basically they were, by volunteer effort, were able to raise $80,000 to hire those guys at the Ohio State to do a business plan for our harvest, um, and they did that. And, but even before they did the business plan, one of the first things the Egg Extension Service told us to do, um, based on their experience with food hubs, was to say, you need to do a survey both of the farmers in the area who might be willing to sell to the food hub, and the buyers in the area, including institutional buyers who might be willing to buy from the food hub. And so we did that, and what we found after doing that survey is that the demand far outstripped the supply for locally grown sustainable food. Um, and so part of the result of that was that the, in the, we incorporated into the business model an incubator farm um, where the first 50 acres or so of the, of the co-op is gonna be pretty much dedicated to becoming an incubator farm which means it'll be a training farm for farmers because there aren't enough farmers. Part of the, the reason there isn't enough production is there's not enough farmers to produce to meet the demand. So what we concluded is we need to be able to train farmers. We came up with this idea of the incubator farm. Um, and Ohio State had already created a curriculum, a two-year curriculum, where students can go through this curriculum and come out for work on the farm for two years and they come out of it certified as a certified produce farmer, right? And so that was a skill that they would gain. And so long and short of it is we are now, since working with Cincinnati State, who's agreed to buy some of our production for their cafeteria, but they've also adopted this curriculum. And so we can now have students from Cincinnati State 
getting Pell Grants to go work on the farm and, and get university credit for doing so for two years, and that will become the pool of new farmers for us to expand this as we have more farmers and get more land and expand the barn. And so um, I, I just mentioned we're at uh, 10 acres uh, of production right now. We have this, we've now leased this 100 acre farm. We had a major breakthrough last um, summer, uh, along with having Kristen come on full time, but also with our harvest, we were able to get the CoBank, um, which is the old farm credit system, which is actually, ironically enough, the old farmer co-op bank from the New Deal legislation that were later privatized under the Reagan administration to a certain degree, but they still have this agricultural mission. They gave us a $550,000 loan for the farm and food hub. And the, the main, one of the main reasons we were able to convince them to give us a, a commercial loan was that A, the business plan was so, was really well done, I think, and then B, um, Ellen was a, and others were able to go around to these buyers who'd been buying from the co-op for two years and, and get letters from them saying, we have been buying production from, you know, produce from our harvest for two years, we like what we get, and we, if you give them this loan, we will buy more. And that was enough to get them over the top to get this funding, which was a huge breakthrough that really, with, especially towards meeting our, keeping on track to meet our business plan, which we've, we've been able to do. So that allowed us to buy a tractor. You know, uh, the, the farm manager, um, one of the worker owner farm managers, is a, was an organic farmer in California for 20 years, and he knows that side of the business very well. In fact, he's invented his own um, harvesting equipment for certain um, uh, produce and so forth. So we were able to get some more equipment to put up some hoop houses to extend the season and provide more unemployment or um, employment opportunities. So that was a huge, huge breakthrough. And what the Egg Extension Service said about that all along was, ideally what you wanted to do in a food hub, and they have experience with food hubs, not necessarily union co-op food hubs, but food hubs generally, is that you want to eventually get to contracts. Because you want Cincinnati State or the hospital or somebody to get give you that contract. But the challenge is, it's a chicken or the egg problem. You have to get the production levels up to be able to even bid for these contracts. And so by getting those letters, we were able to kind of walk that line and convince them that we were on the right track without actually having the firm contracts in hand. So I thought it was, that was a major victory. And, and the reason they say that you want to get the contract is in with produce farming, and I, you know, you hear a lot about the, um, you know, the one and two acre farms, and that's all, there's nothing wrong with that. But in produce farming, if you don't have that, what the contract does is it tells you what to grow, right? So if you get Cincinnati State to give you a, a, a big contract, then you know you have to grow 10,000 heads of lettuce, 1,000 tons of you know, tomatoes or cucumbers, whatever it is they want. Because if you don't do that, and I think this is part of the problem with the local food movement, is you have to choose from 225 different crops all of which are different crops and require different types of growing skills and different types of equipment, right? So if you're gonna ramp up to the next level, you need to know what you're gonna grow and that's what those contracts give you and that allows you to ramp it up and then it also allows you to go to the lender and convince them that you're gonna have enough volume, somebody's gonna buy the volume and make your loan cash flow. So that that is a key part of that. Um, and I, I just one, I guess one final part of this I think that I'll touch on and then I'll, I think I'll quit. Um, but, and open it up, you know, we can get back to any other questions. But um, I think the other point is, so we're at 10 acres with 15 workers right now. We have this 100 acres lease. Um, and, and that, like I said, that, that loan helped us uh, keep on plan track for our business plan. Well, if we meet our business plan within three to five years, we hope to be up to 200 workers between both the farm and the food hub, um, and we hope to be um, farming 600 acres. So that's that's pretty big. But um, in, well? in three to five years, somewhere, in, you know, give or take, somewhere in that range is the idea. Um, what Ohio State did is they actually extended, projected that out further, and of course it gets probably gets it does, you know definitely gets a little more iffy and inaccurate as you the further out you go. But they nonetheless took the basic business plan, projected it out 10 to 15 years, and um, 
when, when they did that, what they, they looked at as a reasonable, you know, plausible scenario would be we could be up to 8,500 acres and 1,600 workers. So that's pretty impressive. Um, you know, in the local food movement, there's a lot of buzz right now about the 5% shift of the idea of taking 5% of the, um, the a state's product, uh, the, the pur purchases of food in, in that state and shifting it to 5% 5, 5 of it more towards lo local production. Um, so there was a study done on, on Ohio and they crunched the numbers on that and, and in Ohio people spend about $29 billion a year on food, but only $3 billion of that is sourced in Ohio. The rest is all imported from around the globe, you know, the Walmarts of the world, right? And so, um, when you look at this, this eight, I said 8,500 acres in 10 to 15 years with 1,600 workers, so they looked at then what would it look like to get to that 5% shift in Ohio, and what it would look like is you would have to have 20 of those 8,500 acre food, uh, food hubs that would be 32,500 workers. So that's the sort of scale that we're talking about that I think is important, especially for those of us, and I come from the local food movement and it sort of was shocking to me that I just don't think people are, are tracking on the, the kind of scale we're looking at at the local food movement to get to that kind of level. Um, you know, and that's only 5%, but still, and, and so in some ways it's small, but as far as where, where the local food movement is now, that's a pretty formidable um, thing. And so, uh, I, you know, I think, and so I think the, the, the point is, is we need to be able to, if we really want to start taking market share back away, back away from the industrial food system and away from the Walmarts of the world, then we need, we need to think, we need, we don't need to rebuild global exploitive supply chains like Walmart, but what we do need to do is be realistic that, and, and acknowledge that there is a kernel of truth in economies of scale that there is a role for certain economies of scale and mechanization. And you need that for a couple, at least a couple of reasons. One, on one front, we need to get, a, get that scale that you bring, bring the cost down um, of, the, of the produce. So when you're going to try to get those contracts, you have a, at a price point where you're actually gonna be able to compete to get those contracts. On the other side of it, we also need to get the cost down if we wanna pay the living wages that we want to play, pay to the workers to get the labor standards and the benefits that we want to get. Um, and uh, that is the other part of the, the model is, is that the merger part of the model brings the union into it and the, the main feature of that is that the, in the modern model they have a social committee that represents the, the workers and in the union, in the union co-op model we merged that with the union model and collective bargaining model in the United States and replaced the social committee with a, uh, a collective bargaining committee that's also been elected by the workers, but then it negotiates a real contract with the management who is also worker owners and the board are all worker owners. But I think what that does is that allows, what, we're, what this model allows us to do is to acknowledge that even in a worker-owned co-op, there is still a tension between labor and management that needs to be dealt with. And you mentioned that the local, you know, that the worker-owned co-ops are, you know, there's not very many of them. And if you look at, around for them, there's not very many that are over 200 worker owners, the really worker-owned model part, part of that. And in my limited experience, I think part of the critique of that is, I think too often worker-owned co-ops might, um, they think they form, they form a worker-owned co-op and they think they've solved the labor management question and they haven't, okay? And so in the really, in the best uh, worker-owned co-ops that I've seen, the, the ones I've seen are more like 40 or 60 members. Then the good ones, what see, they, the thing they have in common is they, they usually have a personnel committee and they usually have pretty good personnel co um, uh, policies. And interestingly enough, those personnel policies look very much like a union contract. <laughs> Um, you know, rights of appeal and all that stuff is, you know, is what you do in a union contract. And um, I think the problem is, is that when people, but when you talk to the people who's doing it, they'll roll their eyes and talk about how many hours they spend in the meetings wrangling over these personnel policies. And, and so they're good policies, but it takes a lot of energy and time and effort to do that. And I think the promise of the union co-op model is that we acknowledge that there is that 
con you know that dichotomy up front, even in the worker own, and we give permission to the union committee to represent where the worker had, represent the interest of the workers, and go negotiate a good contract on behalf of the workers. And then we give permission to the management to wear the management hat, and their job is to make sure that the, the enterprise survives and is viable in the long term. And there, it's very, you know, it's clear cut. And then once we have that contract, I think that is the promise where that will allow us to hopefully scale these things up to the levels I was just talking about to, you know, um, 8,500 work, 8,500 acres, and 1,600 workers. That that's how we hope we can get there. I think I'll stop there. Now is it at the end of everything or at the end no, of the yes. oh. Yeah, oh, okay. in the okay. um, So I'm going to talk about uh, incubation uh, from a grassroots level. Um, dealing with people, I'm, I'm Audrey Patel from uh, DC, and I work with a group called the Co op Incubator of DC. And so our strategy was to try to incubate co-ops among people who were unemployed for a long time, uh, between uh, people who were immigrants uh, who didn't speak the language well, or who were illegal and couldn't get jobs. And so uh, a co-op would be the only way that they could actually have work, get some income. And also uh, co-ops among young people who were you know, needing work, you know, to help with the uh, expenses at home, and um, you know, wanting to have money to buy clothes and do other kinds of things. Um, and so, actually, this got started. I, I worked in the um, the U.S. I was a co-founding um, board member of the U.S. Federation of Worker uh, Cooperatives and the Eastern Conference for Workplace Democracy. And I worked with. NASCO, North American Students of Corporation. So I did a lot of work <laughs> in co-op movement, flying out of DC all the time doing national work. And it just hit me. Um, actually, I went to uh, Mondragon in 2011 and um, you know, was, of course, impressed by all of that. And it just hit me that locally, I had not been doing any work on co-ops. <laughs> I was flying all over the country doing it everywhere else except for Washington. So when I came back, um, you know, I tried to uh, get some people together. I actually had a, a report back. And um, one of the things that I really like um, that Mondragon does is this salon um, uh, project where they help people to uh, start a business. It could be either a co-op or it could be a, a for-profit business. But, you know, they give you the space and the time to really do your research and figure out what it is you want to do and what you need to do to get it off the ground. And so, you know, take, taking a little bit of, from that, we kind of tried to do a corp, um, uh, our in, our incubator with uh, those three groups of people and try to figure out what it is that people need to do a co-op. And one of the things that we found out is that and what some people would call marginalized community. But it, it affects everybody. I think we all have what I would like to call uh, internalized uh, oppression, where we might think because we're working class that we don't have the skills to run a business or to be in a co-op, that that's something you know, rich people do or smart people do, people with education, uh, that's what they do. Uh, if you're a person of color, we've been taught in this country that you just aren't smart enough or whatever to do those kinds of things. That's something white people do. Uh, if you're a woman, that's something that men do. You don't have the smarts or the, the go get them or the whatever to do this kind of work. Um, you know, if you're uh, just differently able, that's what able people do. They go out and start business. Um, if you are um, uh, of a different sexuality, then you can't really start a business because you're so different and people aren't going to support you. So we, we, we all suffer on some level, a lot of us, about um, thinking that we're not capable or good enough or have the skills or the education to start a co-op. And so what DC Co-op Incubator wanted to do 
was to take these people who have been unemployed for a long time and say, you can do it. You can start a business. Um, uh, there, there was um, um, day laborers, for one, who would sit on the corners, you know, uh, people from other countries, sit on the corners of um, Home Depot or Whole Foods and other places trying to get somebody to give them a job for the day. And then often they would get discriminated against, you know, people would not pay them or, you know, uh, you know they end up doing more work than they thought and not a lot of money. Um, and so, I would try to organize people to show them how they could overcome some language skills, some business skills, and some other issues to try to have a working business that would give them some stability uh, in, in their work. And for one, just make sure they got paid. Um, and then people who were unemployed and didn't have a lot of skills. You know, we're living in an economy now where you have to have some skills. Very few jobs are uh, unskilled. I mean, you, you think about the co-op that you know people can readily uh, start. They're um, cleaning co-ops. They're laundry um, co-ops. They're um, uh, lawn, lawn work. Um, you know, stuff that doesn't really require a lot of skills. It takes some skills to do those things, but not a whole lot. You know, you don't have to have gone to a trade school and all of that kind of stuff to be able to do the work. Um, so we wanted to, to, to get um, co-op businesses started that people could start pretty easily without a whole lot of capital involved, uh, without a whole lot of uh, too much of anything. And so, you know, except your, your desire to really work. And so the whole idea was to have um, a, a group of professionals who could provide accounting, um, administrative skills, um, of course, you know, do um, uh, marketing and other things uh, to help get a business off the ground. Uh, and of course, one of the big, big things was education. Education and uh, what I call um, uh, <laughs> I don't even know what you call it. It's like uh, reworking the mind, uh, getting people to see that they have value, that they have creativity, that they they have something that they can offer that the society may not value. Um, you know, they're really quick. They're creative. They're um, any number of things that can be utilized as a skill, as an asset. Um, to, to help the co-op. And so we developed uh, uh, what we call a layer. We, we had a core group. We met like two, two years. A core group of um, five of us who um, would do all the work. We met every other week. <laughs> Developing programs and um, set, trying to set this stuff up. Recruiting people who were lawyers, law students, accountants, marketing people uh, to provide what we call that second level of support for an uh, incubator. And then um, we worked a lot on an education program. And education and married with uh, business, uh, uh, what do you call it, business plan uh, writing. So we didn't just have education. We'd, um, we'd, we'd talk about uh, a, a subject and then give you homework. Um, and everything we set up, the, the program was to help the co-op get to the point of writing their own business plan. So you're learning and you're writing and you're doing at the same time. And in class, you, um, you know, we talk about what you learn, your homework, what you got out of that, um, what you realize you need to know in addition to what you thought you needed to know. And um, so, you know, we kind of worked that, that process of um, learning, doing, and talking. 
You have to get people educated. You have to get them used to talking in a group. You have to get them to understand that they have value. Because in a million different ways, we're told that we don't have value in this society. And so that's a really big piece, the, the, um, the reworking of the mind, <laughs> the reworking of the heart, the, um, the validation of your creativity and your innovation, um, the giving of hope. Hey, yeah, I can't get a regular job out here, but if I get together with two or three people, then maybe we can um, start something. Start something. <laughs> we can make a little money. <laughs> and, and, and that was a really good um, uh, uh, business opportunity with um, <coughs> interpretation in DC, and probably in Baltimore too, because um, there's, there's never enough interpreters, interpreters in hospitals, courts. Mm -hmm. It's just you know, just all kind of neat for us. But um, that actually turned out to be very hard to do because you know we, we live in an individualistic society. Let's face it, we have been trained to be individuals and only concerned about ourselves. And so um, you have to kind of work with people, and that's another thing, uh, to get them to operate from the good of the whole. We're trained to be very selfish and concerned only about ourselves or our family or whatever. And so that's a process. And. Um, and so we, we, uh, we talked with a lot of people who had done um, incubator work in New York and um, Sunset Cooperatives with the Texas. Um, Mission Texas. Yeah, right. And so Corporation Texas. We, um, you know, all of this was done on volunteer time. You know, some of us had jobs, some of us didn't. And so, um, what, you know, after talking to a couple of groups, we came to the conclusion that this work was so involved that we needed a lot more than we could have given. Because, you know, we developed a 12 week education program. And so people can learn in 12 weeks, but you know, like throwing people into who maybe, maybe who have not had a lot of. Uh, uh, experience doing certain kinds of things. Well, now you've trained them and you set them up and you expect them to, to function. And what we learned, in particular from Corporation Texas, was that, oh no, it doesn't work like that. You have to work with them for months to get people used to taking power again, because they've been told, you can't do this. And so, even though you're telling them, yes, you can, you can do it, you know, they, they have that self-doubt, they have issues at home that come up, there's all these things that keep people from functioning at their best. And so there's a need to, to really hold hands a lot longer than you ever think. And so, um, so the, the bottom line is the organization uh, disbanded because we did not want to start something that we couldn't finish. We didn't want to give people hope and then have them crash and burn. And then they might think, oh, well, that co-op stuff, that's just a pipe dream. We'll never, we can never do that. And so it's like we're, we're, we're still working on finances. Finances and body. You know, money is, is always the, the big thing in, in um, trying to develop co-ops and change the world. Um, but the thing is, we have to find a way to do it whether we have the money or not. Because we live in a world where people are dying. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a, a situation that, um, if it's not engulfing you now, it will later. <laughs> I mean, we have seen that people have lost jobs that never thought they would lose jobs. And so you might be doing okay today, but what if you get laid off tomorrow and you can't pay your mortgage? Or, um, and you know, we have, we've had the crash and we have a lot of that happening now. So, um, I just think it's a way that we need to start thinking about how to, uh, I guess the guy called corporatize everything we do because we're going to need to survive.
So basically, that's my experience with incubator. I still hope that we can develop uh, the ideas more and more. Um, and you know, we're still working creatively to try to figure this out. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, were there any successes or learnings for instance for Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the things, one of the exciting things were with the kids. The young people were very um, excited about doing it. They actually did a bakery co-op. So they loved to make pies, and so they would make pies and sell them around to, to different groups. And they're actually still working on that. You know, we you know trained them and they're, they're doing their own thing. They, they have facilities at school and stuff like that. So that's working pretty well. And so that's, 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 that's one of the, the, the good lessons is that, you know, we, we tend to think that young people don't have whatever it takes to, to do things, but they, they have a lot more energy and excitement <laughs> than we realize. And so that's a good area to really work on. And they get it, you know, they get it and they love it. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about the uh, wage structures in, uh, in the project, the farm project that you're working on, and, and also the other, uh, really, really the others. Um, what's the wage differential look like when there's cooperative? You know? Sure. Well, the um, in the Wonderland model, we have between six and nine salary levels between the uh, bottom and the highest. Uh, we found that that uh, produces a wage and community solidarity, uh, and our goal is to create a rising middle class. So in Wonderland, which is a blue collar, working class town, about thirty-five thousand people. You don't have any big mansions, but you also don't have anybody sleeping on the streets. Right on. Beautiful there. Yeah. And, and is there tension created in, in even in that model uh, across, you know, like how, because I think one of the challenges is that folks just don't understand if you've never been a manager, what a manager does, per se, and why do they get paid more? You know, like is there, how does that, how does that tension get one down? People tend to forget that cooperatives are very efficient, competitive business organizations. In the Mondragon cooperatives, we compete against the Germans for engineering. We compete against the Italians for design. Uh, we're lean, but without being mean. So uh, we really want good CEOs, good CFOs, good marketing people, uh, good production engineers. We want high, quality production personnel because the functional uh, aspects of a company, no matter how it's structured, is always the same. Um, and, and, and to make sure that the business cycle and your entity, however it's structured, is, is profitable. Um, what we do is we have um, you know, one worker, one vote, uh, an equal access to equal share ownership, and only six to nine salary differentials so that uh, when profits come in, um, you know, everybody shares it in an equitable way, and people's opinions and rights are explained. The other side of that is when things fail, everybody gets to participate in bailing themselves out. Um, you know, we don't think about that part uh, enough either in our models, but um, at the closing session, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because sometimes we learn you know, more from our failures than our successes. However, what this does is uh, we can't um, we can't discount what having an equity uh, piece does to your mentality. People are willing uh, to do a lot more when they feel that they own uh, their enterprise um, and when their opinion is consulted. Um, and I think that um, we try to strike a balance between paying a family and community sustaining wage, uh, having ownership that is a, real, is a real deal, creating a solidarity economy, and making sure people don't lose their benefits, that they have optimal benefits in the process. And I think we, we in the union co-op model, as Dennis explained and put together, we try to put all of those elements 
taking them undergoing experience and then translating it into an American context. Okay. And, and does, yeah. do you know about what's going on with this art? Is that the Madrigal model that's being used in it? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they've got in the bylaws the, the ratio or anything in there yet. But, um, I know that they pay the, so the farm manager gets paid a little, you know, his scale is going to be a little. I think the other thing is is that um, I, I, I think I missed some of this in the presentation, but so the what do the unions bring to the table? Well, one of the things the unions bring to the table is collective bargaining. So, you know, you have a worker committee that's going to sit down with the management and have that discussion with other worker owners, and and they're also those worker owners. Are, so the worker owners are going to elect the union committee. They're going to elect the board of directors who either appoints the management or maybe the management's directly elected, but everybody's worker owners and everybody has a say. And with the union model, the workers' rights are specifically addressed in the contract. And, um, and so the equity side of that, you know, is I think further defended with, with the, the collective bargaining part of that. The other things that the, the, the unions bring to the table um, are that we're going to be able to bring leverage on health care costs, and so we're going to hopefully be able to bring a health care package to the table that is going to be better than a lot of businesses by themselves because we have 1.3 million members, so we can leverage you know, some lower costs in health care. We have pension funds that we can bring to the table, and I think a very um, you know, important um, other benefit is the unions bring to the table a political arm. And given the discussion that I threw out there on the, the challenge of Walmart and corporate power in our democracy, that is no small thing. So why is it that the Koch brothers and the right wing are doing, you know, unleashing every resource that they possibly can to pass right to work, to, um, you know, get rid of uh, state-owned liquor stores with union contracts, public bargaining, to attack the union movement because they understand that in the United States, as low a density as we are in the union movement, that the unions in the United States are the last organized opposition on the left. And if they can, if they can destroy the unions, um, we're the last thing standing between them and total corporate rule in, in the United States. And so they're, they smell blood. And so for the unions to be able to go with this model into the co-op world and help and have it be a growth strategy for the unions, is going to be important. And also, I think if you look at the co-op worker world, at least my experience, is um, there that it ranges from um, very, very, almost, you know, not very political to almost apolitical, to almost taking, some people in the co-op world, I've found, take a pride in not being involved in politics. And I think that, uh, not, not everybody, but I'm just saying there's a range, that range, and I think it's a mistake that we cannot we cannot let sort of the corporate message that government is evil, incompetent, and unable to do anything prevail because they don't believe that. They they are telling us that so that they can so that we don't care about the government right. anymore mm -hmm. and that they can seize the government mm -hmm. and you can you can just count you can count on it that they will they will not hesitate to wield the state against us. And so we cannot afford to abandon politics and abandon the state to the corporate elite, to the cor corporate poop. Here, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, so I just think that having that, that political, that's one of the things that the unions do, still do pretty dang well. I was telling the earlier class that last, in 2012, I spent about three months. I mean, when you work for the union, I was out in Iowa, and we have 15,000 uh, members that are in the meatpacking plants in Iowa, we spent three months starting with getting the list of workers at the plants from the companies that we were able to do because they have to give it to us under the contracts and going out and, and going door to door and finding out that about 10% of those addresses aren't any good because they're afraid to give their right address. Because right. they're, they're basically very, you know, less than two or three percent, you know, white Anglo-Saxon workers there. It's people of color are in those plants. And, you know, a lot of 
them are scared. I mean, and then the, some are citizens, but they speak Spanish. So if you run into someone, and if I'm going door to door in Ottumwa, Iowa, and it's uh, someone who speaks Spanish, I have to mark it down on the list, and we go get an uh, organizer who speaks Spanish, and they go back to that door. We get them registered to vote. We find out whether they're going to support Obama. And we go back and we bring them the absentee ballots, right. and we make them fill it out in front of us, and we bring it back. And we turned out the vote in Iowa, and Obama won Iowa. And everybody, you know, everybody, a lot of people talk about how well Obama's not, you know, he's sold out or he's not as great as we all thought he would be. Well, that's all well and good, but elections have consequences. Yeah. And, um, you know, Obama may not be the greatest, but we know. I used to say that about Bill Clinton. It can't get any worse, and then we get George Bush, and yes, it can, you know. And so, um, I, I think that's an important point, that we cannot abandon the state to, you know, to the plutocrats. Sure. So, uh, I don't know, I, I guess just quickly, we, we have a similar ratio in terms of evergreen to, to the pocket one ratio, as well as the specific question. Yes. I certainly agree with the this point of politics, so. So the funding came from philanthropy, from the Cleveland Foundation. Um, what they did, so there's a couple sorts. So how much does everything cost? I sort of I sort of put it in two ways. So there's sort of operating expenses, you know, uh, doing a lot of what, what sometimes is called the pre-development work, but the market research, the actual, um, you know, writing of the grant applications, uh, the wraparound supports, that kind of thing. And, and just to put round numbers on it, because I've never seen real numbers, so I have to guess. Um, I would say round numbers, about a half million a year is what's being spent. Um, and then there's a one-time capital raise from the Cleveland Foundation at $3 million that provides the seed capital for those build -it businesses. The businesses, you know, the, the greenhouse is a $16 million capitalization. Um, the, um, uh, laundry is about six million, and the solar is you know, several million as well. So, in other words, that three million leveraged another thirty million or so. Um, so the, the so you know the, you don't need all that to be um, equity money. Most of it can be debt in, in different forms uh, or quasi equity, like um, new markets tax credit, which converts into equity after seven years. Um, but that's that's kind of the so you know, it depends on how you look at it. Um, you know, it's not uncommon. Speaking of politics, uh, <laughs> the Mercedes plant that was built in Alabama at the cost federal, uh, state, local subs tax subsidy of more than two hundred thousand dollars per job. Mm -hmm. you know, this, this, is, this is this is routine. Uh, Boeing Corporation. Uh, you may be familiar that the state of Washington just last year uh, passed eight billion dollars in subsidies for over sixteen years. So five hundred million a year that Boeing gets as a check from the state of Washington uh, just to keep a facility from moving from Seattle to somewhere else. So, so in that sense, uh, this is pretty uh, inexpensive and you're actually creating new jobs. But, but, but it is, it's an R&D process. So I mean, if you're looking at a typology of models and actually over here, I uh, can wave an example of, of somebody who actually, or a group actually did a typology of models. So there's a union co-op model. Um, you know, the Evergreen thing co-ops maybe become unionized at some point, but right now they're not. Uh, there's the, the there's the Evergreen model. There's uh, you know an incubation model sort of based on like a, a co-op academy type thing where you basically train people on business development and give them tools, uh, and then they develop on their own. Uh, there's a Nonprofit incubator and spin-off model, which is sort of the the wages and maybe the sunset group you're talking about. Um, so there's, without even thinking too hard about it, there's at least and then you know the co-ops themselves can fund new developments like the Valley Association of Worker Cooperatives. So you know there's at least five different models without thinking about a, a ways of, of doing this work um, and you know. Uh, I think you know there's a so so there's a lot of different tools that hopefully you can think about and, and sort of figure out what makes sense in 
or what combination of things makes sense in, in your community. But um, the model that we're pursuing in particular really relies on either philanthropic or sometimes it can be an economic development corporation, but some kind of financing support uh, because we're working in communities where people don't have the capital to put up the money themselves. Um, and then the, the worker owners buy in over time through a payroll deduction, so that, that, that's how that ownership actually occurs. Um, so once you're hired, there's a year candidacy period, um, and then you're, you're voted into the cooperative and you pay a percentage of your, I think we did 50 cents an hour for the next three years to, to uh, buy into your share. Are there any um, examples that you guys know of of um, private pro for profit companies that have converted into cooperatives, and how does that? <laughs> it's done. How does that look? But done. I can, right? It, it's it's done. Um, you know, and, and I should mention while the number of worker co-ops is really small, there's something called ESOPs, employee stock ownership plan mm -hmm. companies. There are about 10 million people in those. So the, the the notion of employee ownership in the United States is not so rare. Um, and, and most ESOP companies, the majority of them, started out as private companies that were later converted into employee ownership. <laughs> and you can do that for worker cooperatives. There's a select machine company in Ohio where that was done. Um, more recently, there's a, a solar company which uh, called Namaste uh, Solar uh, in Colorado, which is the largest solar installer in the state of Colorado. They have about 25% of the market. Uh, and about 80 worker owners at this point. So that started as a private company was converted into employee ownership. And under uh, US federal tax law, uh, there's the famous section 1042 rollover, which I'm sure is, just rolls off the tip of your tongue, right? It's not that famous. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of, uh, yeah, I always talk about the famous section 9007 of the Affordable Care Act too, that's a different story. Uh, we'll mention that a little bit more later. But 1042, what it does is it's a uh, capital gains rollover. So um, if, if, uh, if it's a private business and you sell to your employees under federal law, uh, as long as you sell at least 30% of the companies to the employees, and as long as you reinvest those proceeds in some kind of domestic stock, and you don't lift anything as long as it's listed, uh, you don't pay capital gains until you sell that stock. So that's a deferred capital gains benefit. It's about a $2 billion a year subsidy uh, for encouraging uh, company owners. And typically when they retire is when this occurs. Um, and if they don't do this, typically the companies fall apart and people lose their jobs. So it's actually, it's actually an important strategy, particularly given that we're entering the baby boom retirement period, uh, to be thinking about this. Just one. Go I just wanted to answer your question. Um, the unions don't really, I haven't had a good experience with these ops. Um, that's a generalization, but it's pretty much what labor thinks. And the, re the reason is, is because um, ESOPs can be multi-class stock. And in the Monday Gone model, we've learned that only one class stock works. Everybody has to have the same class. You have to start off with democracy from the beginning, because if you don't, it's not going to get more democratic as money rolls in. So what happens with multi-class stock is that um, the workers end up holding the stock that's not so good, um, and, and they get the debt. Um, and there's also a problem with market valuations. Uh, the Department of Labor feels that one-third of all ESOPs in this country are fraudulent because the market valuation um, ends up not being transparent, and, and owners sell their company to workers because they can't sell it to anybody else, and workers end up subsidizing the owner instead of the reverse. So I, I think there's good ESOPs, and you know we know a lot of them um, right around here. Uh, Dansko is a great ESOP. Uh, it's also a B Corporation. Um, Eileen Fisher is a, a great ESOP. B Corp so you can do it, but it depends on a charismatic, uh, uh, benevolent, uh, progressive-minded owner, and you know that's that's personality dependent. So you know in the one one model, we try to make it so you can have a total jerk. Um, somehow at the top of this thing, it doesn't change anything because the model's the model and it's got so many robust structures built in to protect the democracy and the equality that you need to be successful um, in the happy ending that you want, um, that um, you're personality independent. And I think um, 
you know, there's a big debate uh, on this. It's going to have to be a bigger debate before it gets resolved. There's a lot of very wealthy people you know, on the ESOP model because the transaction, again, has made a lot of people very profitable. I think that's wonderful as long as the workers share equally in the equity. And until I see that, you know, I'm not convinced. Yeah, I'll, I'll just reply briefly. I don't want to get into a long ESOP debate, and um, I happen to prefer a quick loss to ESOP for myself. But um, the statistics overall show that the the, the non-ESOP retirement plan value of ESOP workers exceeds uh, the non-ESOP workforce in the United States. And then when you add the ESOP retirement value itself, uh, it works out to about $70,000 per worker owner in terms of you know, their 401k equivalent value. Um, so you know the, the average, um, both in terms of wage levels, productivity levels and retirement benefits are, are far superior for ESOP companies as a whole, on average, um, compared to non-ESOP companies. Now, I'm not comparing to worker co-ops, but just to be, so th that's not to say that there aren't the valuation problems, and, and certainly the fraud. I mean, the famous one is the, the Chicago Tribune, um, where basically the, it was structured so that um, if there was profits, uh, Zell, the financer, would get 40% of the profits, and if there was losses, he would get 0% of the losses. Of course, there were losses. So it worked out well for Zell, not so well for the workers at, at, at Chicago Tribune. So there are ways to do what Michael's saying, but I think that the, the averages actually speak to a different story, uh, which is not to say that you don't, you know, ESOPs were designed specifically to be as undemocratic as you want them to be. You can make them as democratic as you want them to be. Too, but legally, there's very little requirements on in terms of democracy for ESOPs. But in terms of the, you know, take-home value, um, they're actually fairly decent. Now, the the worker co the the unions in particular tended to get screwed because the worst time to do an ESOP, in fact, the worst time to do any kind of conversion, worker co-op or ESOP, is when the company is failing. Right. And and of course, that's when the unions generally got involved. Weirton and some others being examples, right? And sometimes they were able to at least give them enough light so that people got their pensions and stuff, and that was you know, a, a modest victory, if you will. I mean, they kept it from closing for another eight years or 10 years. Um, but, but understandably, uh, they were choosing sort of the bottom of the barrel companies to try to save, and, and sometimes they were successful in saving them. Uh, Marlon Mullins won, there's a few, but um, generally that didn't work. So, you know, a, a, an ESOP or a worker co-op won't save a failing business model. So, a little more ESOPs than you probably wanted. In terms of uh, employee ownership, of, uh, can, can the employees cash out? Like, or is it, uh, what happens if the, you know, if, you, if you've got stock or if you've got some piece of ownership and you want to get out, can you actually liquidate that asset? Yeah, typically you do it on exit. Um, so I mean, you can borrow against it without exiting, but, but if you actually want, and, and there, there are laws both for worker co-ops and ESOPs that there's this, you know, uh, if all the money were taken out of the company, if everyone retired at once, that would be a disastrous right. thing for the company, right? So there, there are some protections in terms of, you know, it may take, you know, it might be busted out in two or three years, but you do get your money out as a, an owner. And typically what are, I know it's not easy to say typically, but you know, what kind of equity are these folks seeing? Is it, is it substantial enough to do anything with, or is it more like, you know? Well, with the Evergreen Co-ops, they're too new to be worth a lot, okay? So they put the 3,000 in, there hasn't been a lot of accumulation value yet. Uh, with ESOPs, you have actual data, so there's, uh, I want to say that the value of ESOP equity as a whole is about $900 billion, and there are about 10 million workers, so you do the math, that's something like 80,000 per 89,000. It depends. There are valuation issues, everything that, that uh, Michael was talking about, but uh, yeah, in general, that's an, av an average amount you'd be exiting, you know, would be something in the 60, 70, 89,000 range, and, and sometimes quite a bit more than that, obviously sometimes less. Yeah. But um, in the one of co-ops, you have a 60-year model, and if your co-op is a, a, success, a successful business, that you walk away, you know, essentially with a house fee. I mean, you walk away with a house fee, or um, you walk away with a, with, with a, mid, with a nice middle-class retirement. 
And what do you say? Do you know what the average amount is? Well, it depends because it depends, I know it depends, on, on, the, it depends, it depends on the size of the co-op. It yeah. depends on the profit margins of the co-op. But that share uh, can be equal to uh, quite a bit of money when you have a successful business. Like 100,000 euros or so? Or, or, or more. more. And, yeah. and, so and, it's a comparable number. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, and so you know, they have, it's a $24 billion group of uh, 240 different co-ops at different times. So. But uh, just to clarify, though, like at least this is my understanding from the December meeting we had on you know, the Cincinnati Co-op. So in the bylaws discussion, which aren't finalized yet with our harvest, they're talking about probably a ten thousand dollar donation into the individual account. But people aren't going to be able to access that for like ten years potentially because you have to you have to leave it in there. So that that is not a small challenge to convince some worker owner or worker that, that they want to do that and also in the in the union co-op model we're also going to ask them to pay union dues so it's a you know it's a pretty big ask and the other side of it is is that um, it was mentioned that it's it's a there's a probationary period basically that um, it's not you don't just decide to become a worker owner and, and they're gonna you're gonna be you know you're gonna be in the job for probably a year at least and that's what they're talking about and then they're going to interview you, and I, Cincinnati's talked about it. They're going to go over the 10 principles of cooperation in Mondragon. They're going to go over the union dues, and this is the package. Do you re Are you really serious about this? Because we don't want it. And I think part of, back to the ESOP, so we have Homeland Grocery Stores that I think has about, um, about 15,000 worker owners. And I know that one of our guys is working there, um, has been working with them from our strategic um, development, and there's a big challenge, like for union workers, for regular workers, it is a big leap to go from an eight to five job, eight to five job, to becoming a worker owner. Okay, because you know, there's even though they're worker owners of the ESOP, they don't necessarily think of themselves as worker owners. They still think of themselves as an employee. So. That we're doing a whole program to try to instill instill a worker owner mentality into those folks, but it's hard from the union side because our culture is negotiating with multinational corporations, where we have to go into negotiations once every three years with somebody who's holding all the cards and who's telling us the sky is falling and saying, you know, we're barely making it, and you guys are going to have to take a hit and blah, 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 and we don't know what the book's like, and then we, so we take a hit, and then 10 months later, the CEO gets a $10 million bonus, right? So that, we go in with, the, you know, our culture is to go in and get everything we can in those negotiations, and from the folks that have dealt with these worker ownership um, models at the union level, they say that is a, often a fatal flaw in the union efforts is that our, cult, our mentality is to go in and demand everything up front. And if you do that, and you don't put away, for example, a reserve fund to, to have in place so that the first time the economy goes south, your, your business doesn't go, go under. So there, there's a, I think that's a big, and even just, I, I, I saw, um, I think it's on shift change. There's a, there's a, a engineer's co-op in Wisconsin and some of them are worker owners and some of them aren't. Some of them don't want to be worker owners, right? So they declined to become them, but they're, they still worked it out where they could be, a, they are working in that firm, but they're not, they just don't want to deal with being the owner. And, and I think that's, and we're going to have seasonal workers in our harvest, so you know, not all of them are going to want to stay, you know, put in, put in for 10 years. And I think that comes back to, I think one of the strengths of our model is that's another argument for the union contract, is if you have a union contract, you're able to protect the rights of all the workers, whether they're a worker or not. So, so we, I think that's gonna be our last question because we're running out of time. Is the one thing we're supposed to do is see if there are things, somebody from this group is supposed to ideally report back to the primary. Uh, you know, how many folks here are from Baltimore? Uh, most of you. So is there is there anything that, you guys feel like you take back from this discussion that can be applicable to Baltimore? That's what we're going to be discussing with Henry, but you know, and if anyone wants to try to articulate that, like, well, just quickly along those lines, a couple things. So, Michael has Kristen Barker working with Mondragon, um, and I'm one of my roles at the U.S.
USCW is if there's interest in community around the country that we can come in and talk to our locals and Michael can have Kristen come in and possibly talk to Nicole. So what if there's people that are interested in, in our model, we could, you know, one follow-up would be is if there's in, enough interest here, we could come in here again and and explain at another community meeting and uh, talk about what the steps were in, for example, in Cincinnati to bring together a steering committee and, and launch the, the thing. So and I guess we can do the that same. That, that's, that's, uh, no, we, we do that too. The source. But is there, are there things, I want to hear from the group, is there stuff, anything you guys want to emphasize in your feedback in, in the plenary? Is anyone here actually trying to form co-ops? Or are you just getting yeah. your group? Yeah? You want to say a little bit of what you're doing? Um, we're actually trying to uh, establish a cooperative incubator, so I definitely want to touch bases with the lessons learned. Um, but we're looking at putting, uh, creating uh, a training model, a skills training model that partners with existing businesses um, but creates an augmented service. So, for instance, we're uh, partnered with Gutierrez Studios, that's a manufacturer of uh, wooden metal, architectural fixtures, furniture, lighting, etc. And they're training, um, we co design the bench, and they're training folks in their studio to do the steel and wood manufacturing, then setting up a cooperatively owned business to manufacture and sell these benches and other products. So, we're not competing directly with them. Um, so, and we also, hopefully, will be licensing some of their designs, because virtually everything they do is a one-off design, so we can license and mass produce. They're not a mass production facility, so we can mass produce some of those designs, but setting up that kind of business with cooperative manufacturing structure. Is really cool. Anybody else do it? Yeah. You got my bench outside. A anybody else in the Boston development or you so were at the yeah. university? Is this, does this resonate? In yeah, I mean, I, I'm looking at it from a, how can institutions, and, and you spoke to that, you know, anchors, and I was interested in, you know, it is the chicken before the egg. How can we be convinced to enter into a contract if we're not sure that you could, if a, you know, single farmer? So I'm very interested in, in uh, you know, food hubs, aggregation models in Baltimore, and how that can thrive. So we can probably, you know, I mean, I have to push them all the time, and there's so many barriers, and that's the one of our There's business. somebody here who wants to volunteer to sort of speak for the group at least briefly in five minutes? Or, you know, I, I can touch it. Okay. And you're going to tell you too. Follow. Follow. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.